Well, greetings, everybody. Pastor Scott here. It is Friday morning, uh, July 17th, when I'm recording this video uh, that will be the adult Sunday school video for uh, this Sunday. Usually I record this on Saturday mornings, uh, but as many of you know, I have a funeral uh, that I'll be giving the message at and uh, doing the graveside for tomorrow. So uh, I won't really have a whole lot of time to do it. So I'm trying to knock this out on Friday. And uh, that being said, I'm glad that you're watching. And I know that this is, these are these tend to be kind of long YouTube videos. And I, I, I can see the effect of that when I look at the amount of views that it gets. It really They really only get a few views here and there each time. Um, and that's okay, you know, this is not meant to uh, gain thousands of, of views and, uh, and have, you know, hundreds of followers or anything like that. Although if that were to happen, that'd be wonderful. Uh, but this is really just to uh, continue our, uh, our study through Acts and uh, continue the ministry of the adult Sunday school class throughout this time with coronavirus, which uh, I'm still hopeful and prayerful will um, hopefully be coming to an end as we move into the fall, but that remains to be seen. Um, so I'm going to pray, and then we're going to get started in Acts 26, looking at Paul before uh, Herod Agrippa II. So let me pray, and uh, let's ask the Lord to bless us. Lord, uh, we thank you for the scriptures, and thank you for these things that are written for our instruction, so that we can not only know the Lord, but know how to live for him and follow uh, follow him as his Holy Spirit teaches us. So we pray that that would happen today. You'd help us to um, uh, question our presuppositions and assumptions about what the Word of God says and about what's true, and to use uh, those scriptures as the filter uh, and as the lens through which we examine those things and then churn through it whatever is, uh, whatever is uh, wrong, uh, that it would fall out and that we would uh, only be left with what is the pure and true uh, truth of God. And uh, we know that you've given us your spirit for that very end, for he is indeed called the spirit of truth. And uh, we know that you'll do that today in Christ's name. Amen. So Acts 26, uh, Paul before Agrippa. Uh, Paul, has, um, Paul has already appealed to uh, Felix and Festus. He is wanting to make it all the way to Rome. Uh, to be able to give his message and his gospel message to Caesar. Um, he said the Jewish people have, have wanted to kill him. They've wanted to ambush him, even if it means doing it un unlawfully, because uh, they just think that he is not only an offense, but a threat uh, to the uh, Israelite culture there and to just their whole life. And so so they, they bring him to the, those who are in charge. Again, first uh, Felix, and then, well, first Festus, then Felix, um, who then takes him to Agrippa and Bernice, the, the son and daughter of the previous uh, Herod, and who had died as uh, Acts 12 recorded it. And, and now they're in charge. They're probably, probably still very young here, probably still in their 20s, and they're going to be listening to uh, Paul give this testimony of how the Lord had saved him. And so we uh, find Agrippa giving him permission in verse 1 to speak, and he begins to make his defense. Verse 2 and 3, I consider myself fortunate that it is before you, King Agrippa, that I'm going to make my defense today against all the accusations of the Jews, especially because you're familiar with all the customs and controversies of the Jews. Therefore, I beg you to listen to me patiently. Um, so Agrippa, you know, with his dad having been the, uh, the I can't remember the exact phrase that would refer to his office, but he's, he's in authority by the Roman government over uh, the uh, area of Israel, the area of Palestine there from Caesarea Maritima, which is the, the, uh, the Roman capital of the province of the region. And so uh, this Herod, uh, this, uh, this Agrippa, um, and uh, Bernice, I don't know if she's still there or not, but I think that she is. Uh, they're familiar with Jewish customs and everything because they've lived in the area, presumably for a long time, probably their whole lives, actually. So they're familiar with all these things. And so Paul looks at this as an opportunity uh, to build some bridges and to hopefully make a, a gospel connection. And notice just the humility of Paul. I beg you to listen to me patiently. Uh, Paul knows, Paul understands that to do justice to the story of God's redemption of him is going to require a little bit of time. So, uh, so I'm begging you to just be patient with me and let me plead my case. Um, continuing on, 
He talks about how his manner of life from youth, verse 4, um, uh, from, uh, excuse me, beginning among my own nation uh, and in Jerusalem, that is to say, uh, he is from Tarsus and Cilicia, which is more of a global city. Eventually he goes to Jerusalem as a young man to learn at the feet of, a, uh, of an important rabbi, is known by all the Jews. Verse 5, they're known for a long time that they're willing to testify that according to the strict, strictest party of our religion, I have lived as a Pharisee. Um, reminding of, uh, of Philippians 3 when he says that I was a, a Hebrew of Hebrews and a Pharisee of Pharisees. Um, I mean, just everything about uh, Jewish tradition, uh, Hebrew strictness, I was the embodiment of all of this, and, and I cared deeply about this. And he's going to go into examples of how he uh, carried that out before Jesus saved him. And now I stand here on trial because of my hope in the promise made by God to our fathers, to which our twelve tribes hope to attain as they earnestly worship night and day. Uh, notice the respect that he gives to people of Israel. They earnestly worship God night and day. Um, and for this hope I'm accused by Jews, O king. Why is it thought incredible by any of you, presumably turning to them now, that God raises the dead? And this is interesting how Paul voices the issue, uh, the difference between him and all these other people. I stand here because of my hope in the resurrection of the dead. I believe that Jesus really did rise from the dead, and I believe that this not only fulfills the scriptural promise made to our fathers, but that this is ultimately what he's going to do in the end when he raises all of us back up, either to a resurrection of eternal life or a resurrection of judgment. Um, this should not be hard for them to understand because their own scriptures teach it. And our fathers long to attain this. And a, a lot of Jewish people probably at the time and even today would say, well, no, they, they attained to go back into the land and, and to stay there and to have the temple and for all the people of the nations to respect them as a separate nation who belongs to God and all of that. And Paul would say, no, that's not, that's not what our people have longed for. We want something more. We've longed for something more based on the promises of God. So the question is, what are the promises of God in the Old Testament? If we can kind of summarize it uh, in, in succinct ways, what are the promises of God? The promise of God is the reversal of the curse of death over the earth. That's what he promised to Abraham. Uh, when he first meets Abraham and first calls on him and calls him to this life of discipleship, bear with me here, Genesis 12, uh, 1 and 3, 1, 2, 3, rather. Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land I will show you. I'll make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great so that you'll be a blessing. I'll bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Now, um, this is quite clearly, in the original language of the Hebrew, this is quite clearly a reversal of the curse that was given back in Genesis 3 because of the fall of sin. Notice that there is a, 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 a reversal of the childbearing issues that are promised in the curse in Genesis 3 and a reversal of the marital issues that you see back in chapter 3 as well. Uh, here God is promising to Abraham that he is going to reverse through him and through those who will come after him all of those curses that came back then. And so ultimately, this promise is the same one that he had given to Adam and Eve when he told Eve that she would have a seed who would crush the head uh, of the serpent. The point is, the whole goal here has not just been to create a nation. The whole goal here has been to redeem the entirety of the creation through what he would do with this nation uh, as time went along. And the prophets all spoke in the Old Testament about the, the, the coming explosion of life and blessing uh, for everybody, for, for everybody to enjoy this. Um, and it's a global, not just a national thing that's promised there. You could look in Isaiah 2 to find the idea that the temple is going to be, the mountain of the Lord is going to be lifted up above all the other nations, above all the other mountains. Probably not literally. I mean, to be taller than the Himalayas would require quite a uh, quite a reshaping of the earth's surface, but God could do that. But it's, it's probably just figurative for the idea that the 
the uh, the Lord's Jerusalem is going to be exalted and all the nations are going to stream to it to press in to hear the law of the Lord. That's the prophet saying that the, that this is not just going to be blessing for you, uh, Israel, but this is going to be God using you to be a blessing to all of the other nations. That's what his heart is, is to save the nations. And part of this promise, part of this promise of blessing includes resurrection from the dead. Um, dead, uh, death rather, came because of sin. Jesus will come and deal with sin. That's why he can rise from the dead. And that's why that's so significant is because of the fact that he is reversing the curse and he is bringing about eternal life. In fact, the resurrection is explicit in the Old Testament. Um, and I've heard cases from different people to suggest that the resurrection is largely a New Testament thing. And I would say that maybe proportionally, proportionally it comes up more in the New Testament, but ultimately it's not like it's without witness in the Old Testament. Actually, it comes up all over the place. In the Old Testament, and just a couple of examples of this, if you'll bear with me, um, probably the most, probably the, the clearest one, and the one that that everybody agrees on, would be Daniel twelve two, where he says that many of those who sleep, and this is clearly talking about the the future uh, establishment of the kingdom through the king who's coming, promised back in Daniel seven. Many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, some to shame and everlasting contempt. Very clear reference to resurrection. And Jesus picks that up in John 5 and sort of recasts that exact terminology and says it in a slightly different way. The very next prophet in Hosea, um, Hosea chapter 6, verse 2, After two days he will revive us. On the third day he will raise us up that we may live before him. So this is, an, this is the idea that there's going to be a resurrection for us as well. Um, that's going to happen after three days. Counting days the Jewish way, not the Gregorian way, which is how we usually count days, uh, where if we look at Friday to Saturday, we think of that as two days, because it's just there are two days between Friday and Saturday. But the Jewish way of counting would include all three of those days, and that's why, it's, that's why Jesus went to the cross on Friday and uh, rose from the dead on Sunday, and we call that three days because all three of those days are included. But Hosea is saying that this is not just something that he's going to do, but this is something that we are going to enjoy and be blessed with as well. Um, after two days he'll revive us, on the third day he'll raise us up so that we might live before him. A couple of other examples, Psalm 23, 6. Goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life, and I'll dwell in the house of the Lord forever. That is a clear indication that I, David knows he's going to live with God forever. Um, and then the previous psalm, the psalm right before that, Psalm 22, uh, 29. Bear with me here. All the prosperous of the earth eat and worship. Before him shall bow all who go down to the dust, even the one who could not keep himself alive. And this just a, I don't want to get into what all is, uh, what all is being said there. But the main point is that this is another look to resurrection that's coming in the end. And indeed, you read Hebrews 11, which is known historically as the Hall of Faith, uh, goes through all the you know most important characters in the Old Testament story, and it says that they were all looking forward to the city that has foundations. That is to say, the eternal city, the celestial city, as Bunyan called it in Pilgrim's Progress, uh, this place of eternal life. They were all looking forward to this. So that's why Paul can say, that's why I'm standing here. That's why I'm standing here to defend the very thing that our fathers all look to. This is not a novel idea. This is something that takes the focus off of us and puts the focus on God's purposes for the world, including us. Jesus came to bring that about, and that's why they can't stand what I'm saying. Uh, Paul is defending himself here with so moving on, moving on, um, verses uh, 9 to 11, 9 to 11, I myself, so he's going back now, I myself was convinced that I ought to do many things in opposing the name of Jesus of Nazareth. Um, and I did so in Jerusalem, not only locked up many of the saints in prison after receiving authority from the chief priests, but when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them. And I punished them often in all the synagogues and tried to make them blaspheme and in raging fury against them, persecuted them even to foreign cities. 
can't just kill them. They've got to blaspheme in order, in order for me to be able to uh, see them put to death. So I was trying to get them to do this very thing. Note how in the New Testament, the apostles make no attempt to cover up their past sins. Paul's very clear about his past sins. Peter's very clear about his past sins. All of that. They don't make, they don't try to cover those things up. Neither should we. In fact, I would argue that just like Paul here, we should use how foolish we were in the past as a testimony to God's grace in our lives. And then ultimately that might actually gain a hearing with people who maybe would, wouldn't listen to us if we're just kind of high-minded Christians who are only sharing what we know written in the word of God. Sometimes we should use our experiences in life to be sort of the life raft on which we float the truth of the gospel. Anyway, that was an aside. Uh, moving on here, verses uh, 12 to uh, 18, he tells of his conversion. And I'll probably, looking at the time here, I'll probably just stop after this one because um, I don't want the video to be too long. Uh, but 12 to 18, his conversion. In this connection, I journeyed to Damascus with the authority and commission of the chief priests. And at midday, O king, I saw on the way a light from heaven, brighter than the sun that shone around me and those who journeyed with me. We've dealt with this in the past. This is now the third, uh, the second actually retelling of Paul's conversion in Acts. Third time that we actually read about it. Um, and when we had all fallen to the ground, I heard a voice saying to me in the Hebrew language that is Aramaic, uh, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It is hard for you to kick against the goads. I think that's the first time we read that aspect of what Jesus said to Paul. And I said, who are you, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus whom you're persecuting, but rise and stand upon your feet, for I have appeared to you for this purpose, to appoint you as a servant and witness to the things in which you've seen me and to those in which I will appear to you, um, delivering you from your people and from the Gentiles to whom I'm sending you to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. So tells his conversion story, he includes that little idea that Jesus apparently uses with him. It's hard for you to kick against the goads. This is apparently a common phrase used in Greek drama at the time. And it just is a testament to how the Lord speaks to us in our terms, he uses terminology that we can understand to make a point and a goad is kind of like a cattle prod at the time, and uh, apparently, you know, if, if an animal will, will kick at it, it's because they don't want to go the direction that the master is telling them to go, and yet the master is continuing to stick them uh, with it, and so they keep kicking it away. They keep, uh, you know, they keep just trying to kick against it so they can go their own way. Jesus was telling Paul, who was called Saul, that's his Hebrew name, he's telling him, you've been kicking against my will for long enough. It's time for you to come follow me. And uh, Paul's saying, the Lord got me. That's what the Lord does. That's how the Lord works. That's how he saves people. He saves them uh, sovereignly and, uh, and just appears to them, doesn't ask for their consent. Uh, rather, he shows himself to them powerfully uh, and mightily and in a personal way like Jesus does with Paul here. And the whole purpose is so that he would then go to the Gentiles and to his own people, he says in verse 18, to open their eyes. I mean, they're all living blind, just like Jesus told, uh, just like Jesus told those uh, uh, Pharisees in particular in John 9, you're blind. And the problem is that you say you see. So people live their whole lives blind thinking that they see, thinking that they are um, that they're objective, that they're clear thinking, and that the problem in the world is everybody else, not themselves. And here Jesus says to Paul, I'm sending you to open their eyes, to just open their eyes up so that they will listen to what I have for them, so that ultimately they would turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God. That's a remarkable way of putting it. The idea here is that if you're not living for God, you're actually living under the power of Satan. And Satan is an, is an accuser. He, he's a deceiver. He's been 
trying to convince people since the very beginning that God doesn't love them, that God doesn't care about them, that God is lying to them, and that they are really just autonomous and should live their lives on their own, going their own way. That's what Satan's been trying to do. Instead of them looking to God, trusting him, knowing that he loves them, cares for them, and wants their flourishing, and then following him every step of the way. Um, the whole world lies under the power of the evil one. John writes in 1 John 5, Paul says that Satan's blinded the minds of unbelievers to keep them from seeing the glory of Christ. So what does Paul say here? Jesus sent me to go and open their eyes so that they would see this God who cares, this God who loves them, and this God who wants life for them. And to uh, receive a place among all those who were sanctified by faith in me. That is to say, if they just believe in me, if they trust in me, I cleanse them. They don't need to do anything. They just need to trust in me and know who I am. Um, and that faith cleanses them. Remember Jesus telling the apostles, you're already clean because of the word I've spoken to you. My truth has a power to wash you, to clean you, to give you a clear conscience, and to show you through my Holy Spirit that you're walking in the truth. And Paul says, this is the whole reason why I was called. I'm standing here. I'm testifying. That's why they can't stand me. That's why these Jewish people can't stand me. Because I'm telling them that they're wrong. And that they need to repent and look to this Lord who not only wants the best for them, but wants the best for the whole world as well. So that's, that's long enough. 21 minutes. I already went longer than I uh, initially wanted to. So I appreciate you listening. Uh, but let me pray. And then uh, I'll let you go. So Lord, make us be ambassadors in the same way to carry this message of God's mercy and grace, his love and his kindness, um, to open the eyes of those who are blind and help us to live wide awake and with our sight unhindered as we look to you and as we look to ways that we can be used by you to advance your kingdom today. And we pray all this in Christ's name. Amen. Lord bless you. Talk to you later.